elderly couple were sitting out on the porch and he wanted to encourage her so he said I'm proud of you she said why he said I'm proud of you why I'm proud of you she replied I'm tired of you too not always easy to encourage someone the words get lost in translation but we could all use a compliment there was a fellow who stepped into a bar and he was the only one in the bar except for the bartender and soon the bartender disappeared and so the fellow was surprised as he sat at the bar and he heard the voice say my that's a nice haircut and he looked around didn't see anyone and look where do you get your shoes shine boy they are special Spick and span. The fellow looked around, still didn't see anyone. And then the voice said, it's been a long time since I told you what a good man you are. About that time, the bartender walked in and the fellow said, I don't know what's going on, but I keep hearing these nice comments, but I don't see anyone. And the bartender said, oh, that's the peanuts. They're complimentary. I can go on all day. (laughs) Finding the right way to encourage someone is not always easy, and yet it is absolutely essential. Discussing the beauty of a sacred home, that is, a home where God is present, we find that words of encouragement are the lifeblood to a sacred home. Before we begin that conversation, we want to offer a prayer, especially for our first responders. You're likely aware that two officers were shot in San Antonio this week. One passed away, the other still in the hospital. And so, Heavenly Father, we'd like to pray for Miguel Moreno's family, for the grief that they must carry at this hour. Comfort, please, upon his family, wife, children, and extended family. We pray for the healing of Officer Cavazos. And we pray, Father, for all of our first responders who are so willing to place themselves between us and danger. And on this 4th of July weekend, Father, we extend our prayer to to include our gratitude to live in this country. Thank you for all who sacrificed to grant us this freedom. We pray in the name of Christ. And all the church said. And so I don't know who came up with the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But that person was never called fatso or stupid or ugly or lazy. Words have the power to wound, but words also have the power to heal. I believe this was the point of the wise man in the book of Proverbs when he said, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Then he says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. What an amazing statement to make. But haven't you seen that? Think of the people you enjoy talking to, people you enjoy being around. Odds are they speak life into your life with their words. They encourage you. They lift you up. They give you insights and wisdom. They they have an ability to stir life in your life. If you're an oak tree, they're a summer shower. Think of the people you avoid. Odds are they speak words of death discouragement, cynicism, pessimism, often critical, slander, gossip. If you're an oak tree, they are oak wilt. They bring death. So the power of the tongue, the power of the tongue to bring life, the power of the tongue to bring death. And then the wise man says, Something about marriage. It's interesting. He makes a statement about the tongue, about words, and then it says if that makes him think about marriage. And he says, he, look at the verse again, 
Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And then he says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. It's as if this discussion about words makes him think about the home, which makes perfect sense because no relationship demands careful word management more than a marriage. No relationship demands careful word management more than a marriage. The more intimate the relationship, the more powerful the words. The more intimate the relationship, the more powerful the words. If someone doesn't like the way you drive and they yell from their car to yours in traffic, goofus, you don't like it. But the person doesn't know you. It's easy to dismiss the slander. They don't know how brilliant you are, how wise you are, how mature you are. They don't know you, so you just can dismiss it. However, if your spouse or your parent calls you a goofus, you may act like it doesn't bother you, but indeed it does. Because the more intimate the relationship, the more powerful the words. If that person knows you intimately, knows you personally, then what they say affects you. And if they criticize you, it can hurt. Conversely, when and if they bless you, if they encourage you, oh, you can drink that, live off of that forever. Because the more intimate the relationship, the more important the words. Research projects have determined that the most reliable predictor of a success or failure in marriage is the words spoken one to the other. In one study among couples who ultimately stayed married, only five out of every hundred comments were put-downs. In marriages that would later split up, ten out of every comments were insults. In other words, twice as many. Words and cruel comments are like weeds that sprout into the weeds of divorce. In their book based on this research, Cliff Notarius and Howard Markman wrote, hostile put-downs act as cancerous cells that if left unchecked, erode the relationship over time. And in the end, relentless, unremitting negativity takes control and the couple can't get through the week without major blow-ups. Who would have thought that the most single reliable predictor of success or failure in a marriage isn't the amount of affection, income, or education. It is the kind of words spoken to one another. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. This makes common sense, but folks, it also makes spiritual sense. You see, when you criticize somebody, when you slander somebody, you're agreeing with the devil's assessment of that person. And the devil comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And he is a liar. He has never spoken one word of truth ever. So if you steal, kill, and destroy, steal hope, kill dreams, destroy self-esteem then you're agreeing with the devil, you're partnering with the devil, you're actually advancing the cause of hell in someone's life. On the other hand, when you seek to bring the best out of someone, you are partnering with God. And your words become a tool of the Holy Spirit in which that person can find joy or peace or find their destiny. So don't partner with the devil and begin agreeing with God. Stop speaking words of death and do your best to speak words of life. How does this happen? Well, there's one answer that surfaces to the top quickly, and that is speak words of encouragement. Speak words of encouragement. A little boy said to his father, hey, dad, let's play darts. I'll throw them and you say wonderful. (laughs) Every person needs to hear a wonderful now and then here's why there's a discouragement conspiracy afoot companies spend billions of dollars to convince you that you are deficient and inadequate 
Until they can convince you that you're deficient and inadequate, you won't buy their product. Consequently, they have to convince you that your face is wrinkled, so you'll buy face cream. They have to tell you that you're out of date, so you'll buy new clothes. They have to convince you that your hair is dingy, so you'll buy hair color. Marketing companies deploy the brightest minds and employ the deepest pockets to convince our generation that we are chubby, smelly, ugly, and out of date. (laughs) So we're under attack all the time. Every advertisement, every billboard, every announcement is intended to tell you that you are falling short, deficient, or inadequate. We can relate to the two cows who were grazing in a pasture when a milk truck drove by, and on the side of the truck were the words pasteurized, homogenized, standardized, and vitamin A added. One cow looked at the other and said, kind of makes you feel inadequate, doesn't it? (laughs) Inadequacy indwells a billion hearts. Who's going to tell them the truth? Who's going to tell your husband the truth? Who's going to tell your wife the truth? Who's going to speak truth into your kids? Who's going to tell them that they are bought by God and loved by God and chosen by God? Who's going to tell them that they are overseen by a loving father who takes every challenge and turns it into something good? Who's going to tell them that the sum total of their worth It's not found in a bank account or a waist size. Who's going to tell them that they have a destiny that is literally out of this world? Who's going to tell them the truth? Who's going to encourage them? Don't you love the word encourage? As if you're placing courage in someone. That's what courage does. The Bible says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. In San Antonio, we know what a spur is. A spur activates action. Let us consider, this is a great Greek word that means to perceive clearly, understand fully, and consider closely. The idea is someone who's thinking, I'm going to find a way to encourage them. It's not just some spontaneous offhand comment, but it's premeditated. It's planned out. How can I encourage that person? Everyone needs a cheerleader. And so the Bible says, look for the best in each other and always do your best to bring it out. Try this. Sit down with your teenager and say, can I have five minutes to tell you what a wonderful person you are? And then just let it go. Open the floodgates. Cover them with compliments. Embarrass him. Drench her. And just when he or she says, I can't take it anymore, tell them to sit down. You got more to give. (laughs) Cover them up in encouragement. Mark Twain was speaking for us all when he said, I can live for two months on one compliment. Find something you like about your spouse and make a big deal out of it. Get so focused on that one character trait that you love that you quit thinking about the few that you don't. And you tell them how great that is. Wives, watch the nitpicking and the nagging. Husbands, Be careful to compliment your wife when you don't have any ulterior motive. (laughs) And all those comments where you say something critical about someone and then you say, but I was just joking, enough of that. If you have to say I was just joking, you weren't. And the damage is done. Be like the Apostle Paul who said, I didn't skimp or trim in any way every truth and encouragement that could have made a difference to you you got Paul was the king of encouragement now you may find this difficult many people do they find it easy to criticize and to judge but they find it difficult to be an encourager Could be they never saw it in anyone else. Could be they grew up in a home full of critics. But I think there's another reason. 
It seems to me that people who find it difficult to encourage simply need encouragement. You cannot give what you've never received. It's not like we have a distillery of encouragement built in us. And so those who find it difficult to receive, I'm sorry, give encouragement, it could be that they have, their tank is on empty and they could use a fill-up. Remember the theme of this series, Sacred Home. The diagram that I've shared with you, that many people see that a marriage consists of a he and a she And that's it. That's not a sacred home. That's a secular home. That's not a home where there is God. That's a home where he is depending upon she and she is depending upon he, counting on each other to meet all of their needs. He's thinking she will fulfill him. She's thinking he will take care of me. And that's a marriage that's headed toward disaster because no human being can successfully take care of another human being. You cannot complete anyone. That's not your assignment. That's God's assignment. So a sacred home is a triangular relationship in which she goes to God, in which he goes to God, in which she finds forgiveness in God, consequently can give it to him, in which he finds his destiny or his identity in God and consequently is secure in his relationship with God. And then what results is a healthier relationship between the he and the she, because God is right in the middle. My friend Ted Owenby saw this last night at the Saturday service, and after the service he said, a marriage without God is like two ticks without a dog. (laughs) It's pretty profound. But this principle is easily forgotten and overlooked. We preachers are especially guilty of saying, encourage, 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 without reminding you where to find encouragement. Really, the Christian life, listen to this, is more about receiving than it is giving. And Christianity is more about what was done for us than what we do for God. Christianity is absolutely unique in world religions because we're more about what God has done than what we do. It is because God has done good for us that we then find the courage and the ability to give it to the others. As one apostle said, we love because he first loved us. So do you want to love someone? Then let God love you. Do you want to encourage someone? Then receive encouragement from God. How does this happen? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Some years ago, I was passing through a time of difficulty. I was discouraged. I really don't remember why, but I had an idea. I set out to find all the verses I could that described God's encouragement to me, and I compiled them in a letter. I recast them so they were in a letter. If God were to write you a letter of encouragement, it might read like this. It's in your weekend handout. You'll see it's a letter where typically we place the outline. You might want to keep it handy when you need encouragement. It reads like this. Dear child of mine, I am the one who comforts you. I bought you and complete you. I delight in you and claim you as my own, rejoicing over you as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. I will never fail you or forsake you. You are worried and troubled about many things. Trust me with all your heart. I know how to rescue godly people from their trials. Let me strengthen you with my glorious power. I did not spare my son, but gave him up for you. Won't I give you everything else? When you go through deep waters and great trouble, I'll be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you'll not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you'll not be burned up and the flames will not consume you. So don't worry. I never tire, I never sleep. I stand beside you. The angel of the Lord encamps around you. I hide you in the shelter of my presence. I will go ahead of you, directing your steps and delighting in every detail of your life. If you stumble, you'll not fall, for I hold you by the hand. I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I'll make you fruitful in the land of suffering. 
trading beauty for ashes, joy for mourning, praise for despair. I'll live with a low spirit and spirit crushed. I'll put new spirit in you and get you on your feet again. Weeping may go on all night, but joy comes with the morning. And if I am for you, who can ever be against you? You sometimes say, the Lord has deserted me. The Lord has forgotten me. But can a mother forget her nursing child? Can she feel no love for a child she has born? Even if that were possible, I would not forget you. I paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, my sinless, spotless lamb. No one will snatch you away from me. See, I have written your name on my hand. I call you my friend. While the very hairs on your head are all numbered, so don't be afraid. You're valuable to me. Give me your burdens, and I'll take care of you. So here's how it works. Let's say you're driving home at the end of a very difficult day. The boss was grumpy, the clients were cranky, and the computer system went down, and you're discouraged. The old you would have thought, I can't wait to get home so that he or she can encourage me. The new you is more mature and realizes, well, it could be that he or she had a bad day too. So rather than count on him or her to encourage me, I'm going to turn to God. And I'm going to ask God to be my source of encouragement. So you still keep your eyes on the road, even though you pray, you don't close your eyes, church. But boy, you do pray. Lord, help me. It's a rough day, rough day, but I receive your words of encouragement. I receive your blessing. I receive your promise that you love me. I receive your promise that I'll never out your grace. I receive the confidence that you're still on the throne and you're overseeing the affairs of mankind. I receive the promise that I have a destiny and I belong to you and I've been bought by you. And you just allow the words of God to come over you and to drench you and little by little you'll feel those shoulders begin to lift and you'll feel your head begin to lift and hope will begin to enter your heart now your problems may not disappear instantly then again they could but even if they don't you find yourself encouraged and by the time you reach your residence you're not counting on another person to encourage you and if they do that's gravy But if they don't, that's okay. Because you've learned to strengthen yourself in the Lord. In the Old Testament, there's a story about the time that David's men suffered a severe uh, loss in the battle of Ziklag, of all places. David was discouraged, and the scripture reads like this. Now, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his son and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. His men were wanting to stone him. And he was distressed. But what did David do? He strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Can you do that? There are times when people will come with words of encouragement and strengthen you. But it's essential that we know how to strengthen ourselves, that we learn how to receive encouragement for those times in which no person comes to bring encouragement to us. Seminary professor and his wife were on vacation in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, enjoying breakfast one morning when a distinguished gentleman walked into the restaurant. Everybody seemed to recognize him. He walked around from table to table, saying hello to people, welcoming people, almost like he was an ambassador for the town. He came over to the table where the seminary professor and his wife were sitting. And when he found out that they were from out of town, the gentleman gave him a welcome. When he found out the professor was a teacher of the Bible, the man said, can I tell you a story? And without even waiting for a response, he pulled out a chair and he sat down. He pointed through the window and he said, see that mountain over there? At the base of that mountain is a small town, and, and that's where a, a mother gave birth to a baby boy many years ago. The boy grew up, grew up never knowing his father. And in that small town, to be an illegitimate son was, well, it was no small stigma. He came to dread the question, who's your daddy? When people would ask, he would duck his head in embarrassment because he never knew his father. 
When the boy was 12 years old, the church that his mother attended uh, was assigned a new pastor. And after the service, the pastor stood outside the church and, and was greeting people, most for the first time. The single mom came by and the minister introduced himself and heard her name. And then he looked down at her 12-year-old son and he asked the question the boy was hoping he wouldn't ask. Well, who's your daddy? Maybe it was the flush of embarrassment in the mother's face. Maybe it was the way the boy ducked his head. Maybe it was the sudden stillness from the onlookers. Most likely it was a conviction of the Holy Spirit which caused the minister to realize he had stepped into awkward territory. And he lowered himself down eye level with the boy. And he looked and he said, oh, I don't even need to ask. I see the family resemblance. You're a child of God. Your father is the king of kings. You have an inheritance. Live out of that inheritance, son. With that, the gentleman at the table stood looking at the seminary professor and his wife, and he said, had the pastor not said those words to me that day many years ago, I don't know if my life would have ever mattered or amounted to anything. But ever since that day, when any person asks me about my father, I tell them what the pastor told me. I'm a child of the king of kings. My father is God. And I have a great and wonderful inheritance. With that, the man turned. And he began to walk away. Well, you can imagine the seminary professor and his wife looked at each other and then said, who was that man? And they stopped the waitress. Do you know know that gentleman who came over to our table? And she said, oh, everybody does. That's the former governor of Tennessee. Ben Hooper. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. You can change someone's life by speaking life into their life. May your home be a home where words of encouragement are both received and then shared. And as a result, life happens. Amen. Amen. So, Father, this is our prayer, that you, would, that you would take our tongues, make them instruments of encouragement. Even when we have difficult conversations, may we speak truth in love. May we speak life into lives. And, Father, for those words that have been spoken to us in our lives that have wounded us, we ask for healing. And we pray that your word your encouragement would be louder than any discouragement that we hear. Through Christ we pray.